Good morning, guys. So I want to say a huge thank you to Creative Mornings for having me. Such an honor to be asked. And also, again, to IDEO, you're not going to believe this, but last night was IDEO Thanksgiving, so there were like 300 people in here. And um, if you see little orange patches, it's probably like um, pumpkin pie that was shoved into the cracks here. And they pulled off a small miracle getting the space ready for this morning. So thank you, thank you to IDEO. And this is actually where I work. This is my home base. I work right on the other side of the building, and I love this place. This morning, we are, this is me, and we are going to talk about six things death teaches us about life. And I'm just kind of amazed that this many of you showed up at eight in the morning for a talk about death. I mean, that blows my mind. It's not an easy conversation. I mean, it's not like you show up at work in the morning and are like, hey, how was your weekend? Oh, good, cool, mine was good too. By the way, have you thought about whether you're gonna be buried or cremated? Important question, but not something we talk about, really. So if you're not a friend of mine and had to be here, um, I, it, it says to me that you are the type of person who actually likes to grapple with difficult things and who likes to face tough things. And you know that if you do that, it really can offer up a lot of lessons, and that's certainly true about death. Um, I'm gonna share some of those with you today. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about this because I've just finished writing a book about the end of life experience. And um, I found that if you really hold it close and pay attention to it, it can teach us a lot. But before we get to those lessons, I want to just share some personal stuff with you about why I think so much about this topic. So I know you all wrote down things on your name cards about who you've lost, and I'm sure many of you, I'm not going to make you raise your hands, but I'm sure many of you have lost people who are dear to you. Um, I'm seeing some nodding in the audience. So that's happened to me too, and my experience has been that I've lost a lot of the men in my life, and I, I just saw Wonder Woman, so I'm tempted to draw some conclusion about how women really are an Amazon race and have immortal powers. But actually, it's, this has really just been my experience, um, and it's bizarre. My, my boyfriend Steve and my boyfriend Dan both died of the same cancer. Um, this is my dear friend Bill, who had a heart attack while running a marathon. And this is my sweet roommate, Jonathan, who, um, he was my roommate in college, and he picked up a heroin habit when he was in a PhD program at Cornell, and was really trying to get clean and had moved home and was in rehab, um, and then fell in love with, with this beautiful young nurse who was helping him, and when she didn't return his affection, he shot up for the last time and overdosed. I had this moment where I was looking for a photo of John, and it struck me that we were in college together before smartphones and before the internet, so I literally couldn't find him in a Google image search. And it's like if you don't show up in a Google image search, you don't exist. It, we've become so reliant on the internet as our collective memory, and that made me a little sad. Anyway, so this is my stepfather, Thad, who died of the same cancer these guys did three years ago. And then this sweet man in the corner is my father, Stanley Berger. Fresh off the death of my father, who had a pretty difficult death um, four years ago, right around Thanksgiving, so the anniversary is coming up, when this guy walked in through that door back there. This guy is B.J. Miller. Um, he is... He was the director of the Zen Hospice in San Francisco, and he is a palliative care physician at UCSF. He runs a cancer clinic there. How many of you know what palliative care is? You could just raise your hands. That's a fair bit of you. But for the rest of you, um, doctors are trained to fix you and to cure your disease, right? But palliative care is a much more holistic type of medicine. It really considers you as the whole human being. It's a very human-centered way of practicing medicine. So instead of just looking at your disease and trying to cure you, palliative care physicians consider your emotional life, they consider your spiritual longings, they consider your family picture. So BJ, um, you can see, has prosthetics below the knee and half an arm, and that happened when he had a near-death experience as a sophomore in college. 
Um, and he had a very long and painful recovery, and it really radically altered his perspective on life and death and how we see things. And when he came in through that door and shared that at IDEO, I was really deep in grief, and it lit me up, and I wanted to help him spread that message. So we worked on a TED Talk together. That talk has now been seen by over six million people, which completely blows my mind. And we ended up writing a book together, which we've just finished. And the working title is How to Die. It's um, a practical guide for the end of life. So uh, there are a lot of books out there that talk about the dysfunction in the medical world, that talk about how kind of broken the system is. But there's not very much guidance for people. And so it ends up being a kind of crash course when someone in your life is dying or when you are dying yourself. And that's really too bad because death is one of our most profound experiences. It's one of the experiences that unites us, aside from this one, birth. And we spend an inordinate amount of time preparing for this one, right? Like every pregnant woman gets her obligatory copy of what to expect when you're expecting, um, which terrifies every mother, because it's like, your baby's going to die in 10 minutes. Um, it's a really scary book. Um, but there's really nothing for the other end of life. And we wanted to create some instruction for people. Actually, a friend of ours said we should call the book What to Expect When You're Expiring, which is <laughs> kind of crazy. So that leads us to the first way in which death can inform how we live, and that is that we need to be talking a lot more about it. Um, death is hard to talk about in part because it's hard to imagine, right? It's like imagining the infinite. I mean, thinking that all of our plans and hopes and dreams are just going to go poof the moment we're pronounced dead is really impossible to imagine. The other thing is, is that we've really outsourced death now. Death happens in the hospital or in a nursing home. We don't have very much experience with it. And that wasn't always true, right? Like 100 years ago, you lived on a farm maybe, and you saw pigs and goats dying, and maybe a brother or a sister didn't make it until you were 10. And um, maybe granny lived upstairs, and you held her hand until the end. There was a lot more exposure to death back then. And now we're true beginners. I mean, we just have no exposure to it. And when you're a beginner, you make a lot of dumb mistakes, right? Like, nobody has prepared you for it. You don't know how you're supposed to prepare. Nobody's told you what to do. So we're true beginners at death. And what we need is to think a little bit more about it and to talk a little bit more about it. And I know this may seem like it's all very far away from you because you all look very young and smooth-skinned and like you could just get up and run to Utah right now. But the fact is, is that um, it's something that we all need to be talking about it because if we walk out this door right now, there is a chance that we will get hit by a flying elephant. It happens. And then you end up at the hospital and doctors get really busy trying to fix you. And because you're unconscious and they don't know who you are and they can't, you can't answer the questions that, that they want to ask you, they don't know what kind of medical treatment you want. So, for example, if you did not wake up from that injury, would you want to be on life support? And if so, for how long? So I want to help you and get you started on thinking about some of these questions amongst yourselves and also especially with your parents who you know, let's face it, aren't getting any younger. The first question is, what are you willing to live with and without? It's a really important quality of life question. For some people, it's being able to talk to the people they love. For others, it's being able to walk by themselves. For others, it's being able to eat a bowl of ice cream. I mean, whatever it is, there is a deal breaker moment for you. The second question is, who do you want to speak for you if you can't speak for yourself? Can you think about who that person is and think about telling them? And the third one is, who has access to your digital life? It's crazy. They've estimated that 8,000 people die on Facebook every day. Who do you need to share your passwords with? So that leads us to the second lesson, to practice loss. 
This is another way that we can learn from death. Nobody likes losing things. We lose our keys, we lose our patience, we lose sleep, we're losing things every day. But loss gets a really bad rap and I want us to reclaim it. My dad lost his mind before he died. He had dementia and struggled with it for about five years before he died. Um, he was a professor at Cal before that, so he was basically a walking brain. All he did was work and research. He had no hobbies, no exercise. And so it was really hard to watch him lose the one thing that mattered most to him. But in some ways, he was actually able to reorient around that loss um, and find real pleasure in simpler things. So just sitting with me and my kids on the couch and watching my kids goof off in his living room, taking a walk with his wife, just holding hands. And it turns out our bodies reorient around loss all the time, right? So you've heard this, when you lose a sense, your other senses compensate and get stronger. When they do brain imaging of the blind, they find that the blind can actually hear both with their auditory complex and with their occipital lobe, which is the visual processing center, so that the brain actually has reoriented around this loss. It's like the brain rewires around loss. We do this all the time. We're all losing things every day, and it's a way in which things bind us together. You know, we're all part of this big whole and we're losing things. And I love the way in which that unites us too, even with strangers. So I hate to be the kind of person who adds another to-do list thing. Like, you know, you read all this stuff online, like, okay, now for my morning routine, I have to wake up at 6 a.m. and meditate and do yoga before I have a happy and well-adjusted day. So no, I'm not gonna add another thing to your to-do list, but I am gonna suggest that you try losing something little every day. It can be a great teacher. So if you miss your bus, for example, think about taking a walk instead. Lose your patience, maybe wait 20 seconds before you respond to someone and see how that makes you feel. Adapt, reorient around loss. And maybe it will make you a little less afraid of loss, too, because we're going to have a zillion of them before we get to the big one at the end. That leads us to our third thing. What are you really afraid of? Let's unpack that. Fear cars, not spiders. I know that sounds weird, but here's the thing. Almost nobody in the industrialized world gets bitten by a venomous spider. Your chances of that happening are like one in 483,000. But if you were born in 2007, your odds of getting hit by a car or having a car accident are one in 88. So we should be terrified of cars and not care at all about spiders. But when you ask people what their phobias are, spiders make the list and cars don't. The same could really be said about death. What are you really afraid of? Is it suffering at the end? Is it the fear of missing out, FOMO, like oh, the kids are gonna create all kinds of crazy shit in 10 years after I'm dead. It's gonna be flying cars and a female president and I missed it. I missed all of it. Or is it really more about not living in the way that you would have wanted to? Is it really more about regret? So there's a palliative care nurse named Bronnie Ware who uh, recorded the dying in their last 12 weeks of life, and she compiled their top five regrets. The first one is, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. The second is, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. We can all relate to that, right? The third is, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. The fourth, I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. And the fifth regret, I wish that I had let myself be happier. Is there something that you're not letting yourself do? Is there something that you would regret if you were told you were gonna die tomorrow? That leads us to the fourth thing, follow your heart. So we don't have long here. Can we let the fact that we will all die no matter what be exactly the reason that we go for it right now? 
while you're here. There's someone who thought a lot about this, Steve Jobs, who lived with cancer for quite a while. And he said something really smart about following your heart. He said, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. So I'd ask you, are you doing something you love? Are you finding purpose in your everyday? Are you finding meaning? Are you following your heart? And then this last thing I'd ask you is, are you giving back to the world what you have to give? Because I know you have a lot to give, and I'm going to ask you today to give like a tree. What I mean by that is, um, I don't know if any of you have read that kid's book, The Giving Tree, and if you were as wrecked by it as I was. Um, but for those of you who haven't, the story is, is that uh, the tree loves a little boy, and the boy climbs in its branches, and the boy gets older and ends up wanting different things out of life. And so the tree says, take my fruit, take my branches. And the boy ends up stripping the tree down to a stump. Well, by that time, the boy is an old man. And all he really needs is to rest his weary legs. And the tree says, I still have that. I am a stump. Come and sit and rest your weary legs. And the tree is happy. Well, it turns out that is not so different from the truth about trees. Trees actually give and give and give until they die. I learned this from someone who's worked at IDU for 30 years, Jane Fulton Surrey, who paired with a biologist named Tim McGee. And they have been developing something they call life-centered design. And a story they tell is that in the 300-year life of a big tree, it spends the first 100 years, oh, I can't take this away. It spends the first 100 years growing, the second 100 years just living, and then the third 100 years, the tree is actively dying. So it expends an enormous amount of energy, not hoarding its molecules, but shedding its highest value molecules to the ecosystem around it to help nourish other things. It's a really beautiful metaphor. And um, it's something about active dying. And the question I would ask you is, how can we live and die more like trees? Now, we naturally think about giving our material stuff away, right? It's easy to do that. But there are other ways that you can give things away. Um, and one of them is just becoming an organ donor. There's uh, 13 people die every day waiting for a kidney transplant. It's a very simple math for you to change that number just by signing up to be an organ donor. We should really aim to take nothing with us. And in that, I would include our knowledge that we've accrued over life and our stories and our wisdom. Can we give all that away too? That leads us to this point. How do you want to be remembered? Act like Alfred. That's this guy. This lovely beardo is Alfred Nobel. So in the first half of his life, Alfred was known for being the inventor of dynamite. Um, and he was living in Paris and woke up one morning and was reading the paper and sipping his cafe au lait, and he read this headline, The Merchant of Death is Dead. And it went on to read, Dr. Alfred Nobel, who became rich by finding more ways to kill more people faster than ever before, died yesterday. He was confused. Was he about to read his own obituary? Well, it turned out his brother Ludwig had died, and the paper had made a simple mistake and written an obituary for Alfred instead. Alfred was aghast. Was this how he was to be remembered as the merchant of death? And it's thought that it was that moment that got him to set aside the bulk of his fortune to endow the Nobel Prize. And of course, now he's thought of as a great benefactor, and that's how he is remembered. 
So there's a great forcing function to have that kind of second chance. Not everyone reads their own obituary in life. But you can actually write your own obituary. And it's a really great exercise because it gets you to sum up your life in a 1,000 words or less. What did you do? What did you not do? It all adds up to the life you're remembered for. So here's the last thought. We have little control over displays <laughs> or over how we're going to die or when, right? But we do have control over how we live. So can we leave this talk today with just a little bit more urgency? Can we go back to home or back to work and really say goodbye to the people that we're saying goodbye to, knowing that we may not see them again? When you're having a conversation with someone, can you put down your phone and give them your full attention, knowing that we are here together now? Instead of running from death, can we hold it close and learn from it? Thank you.